remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Hi, I'm Pastor Jeff Shreve, and we're in my new series, Written in Stone, a study of the Ten Commandments. Today, we'll learn three vital elements of this fourth and often misunderstood commandment as we study the Sabbath and the Christian. If you have your Bible, please turn to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20, as we talk about the fourth commandment in a message I've entitled, The Sabbath and the Christian. The Sabbath and the Christian. We are to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Now, I was reading about an elderly couple, they were going out with another couple. They were going to go see a movie. It was a double date. And so they get in the car. The men are in the front seat. The women are in the back seat. And the guy in the passenger seat says to the driver, he said, hey, he said, Joe, uh, my wife and I, we went to a, a really great Italian restaurant just the other day. He said, you should try it out. He said, oh, yeah, what's the name of it? He goes, what's the name of it? Hmm can't remember, but I've been taking a memory, an online memory course, and they tell you about word association. And so if I can associate uh, the, the name that I'm trying to remember with, the, with a word, then I can remember it. And so he said, but I'm having trouble. So what's, what's the name of that, of that flower? It has a long stem with thorns and beautiful petals. He said, a rose? He goes, yeah, that's right, rose. Hey, rose, what's the name of that restaurant? <laughs> He's having a little trouble with his memory. He didn't remember. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Well, we're in a series called Written in Stone, a series on the Ten Commandments, and written by the finger of God. These are really, really, really important. And you have to remember the laws of God, that there are ceremonial laws, and there are civil laws that pertain to Israel as a nation, and then there are moral laws. The ceremonial laws have been uh, rescinded in the Lord Jesus Christ. So we don't bring bulls and goats to church. We don't do that kind of stuff. Uh, that's all uh, found in Jesus. The civil laws don't apply to us because we're not the nation of Israel in, in the Old Testament. But now the moral law of God... That is reflective of who he is. That never changes. The moral law of God never goes away. And what we see in the Ten Commandments, on the first tablet of stone, the first four commandments, those are the laws of worship. You worship God only. You worship God rightly. No, no idol worship. You worship God reverently. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. And you worship God regularly. The first four commandments, the laws of worship. The next six commandments, that second tablet of stone, those are the laws of interpersonal relationships. The first four are, are horizontal. The next six are, or first four are vertical. The next six are horizontal. And Jesus put it this way when he was asked, what is the greatest commandment? He said, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind. That's the first tablet. That's the vertical. And then he said, the second is like it and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's the second tablet, all horizontal. And so we are in this study to learn and to discover and to remember what the Lord has commanded. Now, as we get into the fourth commandment concerning the Sabbath day, lots of questions, lots of controversy, controversy, uh, lots of confusion as it relates to that, especially for a Christian. That's why I've entitled this message, The Sabbath and the Christian. 
Uh, do we just blow off the fourth commandment because we say, well, it really doesn't apply to us? And, and I mean, the Sabbath day for the Jews, that was the seventh day. That is Saturday. Uh, I was here on Saturday. None of you were here, but a lot of Texas high graduates were here on Saturday. So they were, uh, you could say, hey, they, they showed up to church on Saturday. We don't, we don't come to church on Saturday. We come to church on Sunday. And so we say, hey, something has happened to the fourth commandment. Well, God wants us to understand the fourth commandment and to obey the fourth commandment in our New Testament understanding of it. So, let's do something today in honor of the Lord, in honor of His Word. Would you stand with me as we read from Exodus chapter 20? Then God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, Yahweh your Elohim, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children on the third and the fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work you or your son, or your daughter, your male or your female servant, or your cattle or your sojourner who stays with you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. You may be seated. So, the question... Do you really understand the fourth commandment? Do you understand what it means to us today? Now, I want to share with you three very key elements concerning the fourth commandment to remember the Sabbath day and to keep it holy. So, you can't we have to understand, we have to listen, we have to learn, and then we can remember what the Lord has said. So three, three uh, key elements. Key element number one, remember why the Sabbath was established. See, he says, remember, call to mind. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Well, remember why the Sabbath was established. Interesting, very, very interesting. The first three commandments, you shall not, you shall not, you shall not. This one says, remember, remember. It's not a you shall not, it's a remember. So uh, is this something brand new? It can't be brand new if the Lord says, remember the Sabbath day. And we know that in Genesis, the Bible tells us about the Sabbath day. The Lord rested on the seventh day. But even for the children of Israel, they knew in Exodus 16 about the Sabbath because when the Lord rained down manna upon the people so they would have something to eat in the wilderness, they ate manna for 40 years, and it would be like dew on the ground, and they would gather it up. It was like wafers filled with honey. Probably the closest thing we would say is something like frosted flakes, but it would sustain them. And here was the thing the Lord said, now, the, you go every morning to get the manna, but the manna will come fresh every morning. If you wait too long, it's going to uh, dissolve in the sun and it's going to be gone, and you can't store it. If you try and store the manna, you will find that it will breed worms and grow foul. You don't store it except on Friday. Friday, you gather twice as much as you need because it's not going to be there on Saturday, the seventh day, the Sabbath day. And this is what the Lord said, Exodus 16, verses 29 and 30. See, the Lord has given you, or Moses said this, see, the Lord has given you the Sabbath. 
Therefore, he gives you bread for two days on the sixth day. Remain every man in his place that no man go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. Well, they knew that before the Ten Commandments, that this Sabbath day is a special day. But God wrote it in stone with the finger of God, commandment number four, the laws of worship in our vertical relationship with him. We keep this set aside to keep it holy, to keep it sacred, this one day in seven. Exodus 31, the Lord goes on to say this, but as for you, Moses, speak to the sons of Israel, saying, You shall surely observe my Sabbaths, for this is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you, who sets you apart as holy. So the sons of Israel shall observe the Sabbath to celebrate the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the sons of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, but on the seventh day he ceased from labor and was refreshed. So why was the Sabbath established? Well, it's established for a sign. And it's a sign between God and Israel, between God and the sons of Israel. And first of all, it was a sign commemorating creation because he always connects it to creation. He says, six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. You don't do any work. Why? For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy because that was his day of rest. So it commemorates God's creation. Now, how did God create? He didn't create by evolution. You will never get evolution from Genesis chapters 1 and 2. No one who doesn't go to school to learn uh, uh, about things other than the Scripture, you learn about science. You know, it's, uh, it was Ben Stein that had the documentary no, uh, no Intelligence Allowed. I think it was called Expelled, No Intelligence Allowed. And he said, you know, you can't teach in the universities today, even in quote-unquote Christian schools, unless you uh, adhere to evolution. Well, you never get evolution from the Bible. But what you do get from the Bible is God created. And how did he create? He spoke. He spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. Psalm 33, verse 9. That's how God did it. He said, let there be light, and boom, there was light. And there was evening and there was morning the first day, the second day, the third day, the fourth day, the fifth day, the sixth day. And we know that evolution can't uh, exist in a macro sense. Why? Because things reproduce after their kind. And so a, a cat is going to reproduce a cat. Uh, a, a canine is going to reproduce a canine. And in, the, in horticulture, you have an apple tree. An apple tree is going to reproduce apples. You don't get a, a lemon from an apple tree. It just doesn't. Things reproduce after their kind. So things can't become other things. And uh, the Lord makes it clear, this is how I did it. And he then connects it to the work week. So we know that when he talks about a day, he's not talking about an age. He's not talking about a geological period. In six days, you shall labor and do your work. What did that mean to them? Well, that's six 24-hour days. And the seventh day, well, that's a special day. You set that apart for the Lord. That's a, that's a seventh 24-hour day. And so we commemorate as we remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. We commemorate God's creation, because that's how God connected it, Genesis 2. And by the seventh day, God completed his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work, which God had created and made. So, a sign for the Jews commemorating God's creation. But secondly, it was a sign commemorating deliverance from Egypt. Now, here's something so cool. So, the Ten Commandments is repeated twice in the Bible. It's in Exodus when it was happening, and uh, that is recorded for us, Exodus 20, but it's also in Deuteronomy chapter 5. Deuteronomy 
is Moses' swan song, so to speak. It's three sermons he gave on the plains of Moab. Deuteronomy literally means second law. And it's not that God is giving them a second law, but Moses is reiterating the law to the people. And in Deuteronomy 5, he goes through the Ten Commandments. When it comes to commandment number four, there's more insight given in commandment number four. He says the same things that we just read, but then he adds this. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out of there by a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. So it's connected to creation. It's also connected to deliverance from Egypt. What is God saying? You're my special people. You're my special treasure. You don't live like everybody else. And there's one day in seven that you set aside to keep holy for me because I am the God who gives you life. And one in seven is a day that is special to me and to be focused on me. So, very first essential, key essential. Remember why the Sabbath was established. Second essential. Remember why the Sabbath was so important. I mean, think about it. He's like, why, uh, why, why did this get, get in the Ten Commandments? To remember the Sabbath, to keep it holy. And why does the Bible talk about the Sabbath so much? You know, you could say, as it related to the Jews, this became the primo commandment. I mean, it's spoken of 130 times in the Bible. It's 76 times in the Old Testament and 60 times in the New Testament. You do a word search on the word Sabbath, and you come up with those numbers in the New American Standard Bible, 50 times in the Gospels. And Jesus got in trouble with the Pharisees so much of the time with, as it related to the Sabbath. You are breaking the Sabbath, they would accuse Jesus of, because they had taken the Sabbath, something that was designed by God, who was a good God, something that was designed to be a blessing, they turned it into a burden. And they wanted to kill Jesus in John chapter 5. Why? Because he healed a man on the Sabbath, and he told that man, horrors, uh, horror of horrors, to rise, take up your pallet, and walk. So they were going to kill the guy because they said, you're doing work on the Sabbath. You're carrying your pallet. You're not supposed to do that. And he said, well, the man that healed me told me to do that. Who's the man that healed you? I don't know. Then he found out it was Jesus. He ran back and says, it's Jesus that told me to do that. So they were going to come after Jesus. How dare you heal on the Sabbath? They had turned it on its head. But now the Sabbath is a very, very important day. And what makes it so important? You know, the, the penalty for blowing God off and doing what you wanted to do on the Sabbath and not keeping it holy, the penalty was death. Exodus chapter 35, then Moses assembled all the congregation of the sons of Israel and said to them, these are the things which the Lord has commanded you to do. For six days work may be done, but on the seventh day you shall have a holy day, a Sabbath of complete rest to the Lord. Whoever does any work on it shall be put to death. You shall not kindle a fire in any of your dwellings on the Sabbath day. Numbers chapter 15, they find a guy, what's he doing? He's gathering wood on the Sabbath day, and they tell Moses, hey, we found this guy, he's gathering wood on the Sabbath day, what should we do? He said, I don't know, we're going to have to ask the Lord, what should we do? And the Lord said, put him to death. He has profaned my Sabbath. And so they stoned him to death in accordance with the, Lord, uh, with the Lord's command. Now, we read that and we say, well, that doesn't sound right. That doesn't sound like something uh, my God would do. Well, it's, it's very evident that's what he did. And so, we, you know, we read passages of Scripture like that and we can't wrap our minds around how can a good and loving God do that. But God does do that. Remember what I've told you. God is not the God you want him to be. He is who he is. I am who I am. And God knows everything about every single person. And sometimes we see God do something and we don't like it. We don't agree with it. And we put ourselves 
We who are sinners above the God who is holy, 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 and we sit in judgment of the God who is holy, 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 and we say, you can't do that. You're not right for doing that. God forbid that we should ever do that. We may not understand what God does, but let me tell you something. A sinful man never points the finger at holy God and says, you're wrong and I'm right. No, God is right, and God does everything perfectly well. Shall not the judge of all the earth deal justly? Yes, God always deals justly. I was talking to a preacher friend of mine at the uh, National Religious Broadcasters Convention, Stephen Rummage, and he, he asked this question. He says, is it possible for God to commit murder? You know, God said to Moses and the people, hey, that guy that broke the Sabbath, stone him to death. Is it possible for God to commit murder? No. It's impossible for God to do that. Why? Because God is the giver of life. And God does not have to take your life. He just has to quit giving you life. Let everyone who, let everything that has breath praise the Lord because your breath is a gift from God. He doesn't owe us anything. Everything we have is a gift from him. But now here is the thing. The Sabbath is really, really, really important. You break the Sabbath and you put yourself in the crosshairs of judgment that will bring about death. But now, like so many things, the Jews turned the commands of God that were intended to be a blessing, and they turned them into a burden, and they turned them into something terrible. And, and they, they uh, created all these laws on top of laws on top of laws. And so they had uh, things that you couldn't do on the Sabbath. You know, you couldn't... Um, if a flea was biting you on the Sabbath, you couldn't kill the flea because they said that constitutes hunting, and you can't do that. You can't do that. on A woman couldn't look at her reflection in the mirror on the Sabbath because, they said, she might look in her reflection and find a gray hair, and if she pulls out a gray hair, that's considered work, and you can't work on the Sabbath. All sorts of crazy things. You can't spit in the dirt on the Sabbath. Why? Because you could disturb the earth and that would be considered plowing. It just became ridiculous. And so they accused Jesus of breaking the Sabbath. He broke their man-made laws on the Sabbath, but he never broke the Sabbath. And here's the thing. We all have a tendency to do this. We take the commands of God and we turn them into legalistic laws. And everything be becomes an external legalism. The Lord wants us to understand the commandments from a heart perspective. And it's not just legalism. For instance, Jesus said, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. And maybe you're here and you say, yeah, I've never done that. I've never committed adultery. But I say to you, anyone who looks on a woman to lust for her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. Who can say they've never looked on a woman to lust for her? Or in the women's, women's case, looked on a man to lust for him. Hey, we're guilty of that. Those are heart things. And God is much more interested. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. The Pharisees did all the external things, but they didn't go deeper and look into their hearts because Jesus said, your heart is rotten. You're like a whitewashed tomb. You look good on the outside. It's external, but inside, it's all rottenness. So remember why the Sabbath was so important, because God is a good God, and he wanted to bless his people. So three reasons why the Sabbath is so important and why the penalty is so severe. Number one, God wanted his people to work diligently. He says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord. In it you shall not do any work. God wanted his people to work, and he had six days for them to work. And see, don't ever get the idea that work is a bad thing. Work is a good thing. Don't ever get the idea that work is a, is a, a consequence of Adam and Eve breaking God's commands. No, 
Before Adam and Eve ever broke God's commands, when God created Adam, he created Adam before he created Eve, the first thing he did was give him a job. He was working. He, he put him in the garden to cultivate it and to keep it. That is work. Now, the, the uh, consequence of sin was you will earn your bread by the sweat of your brow. Toilsome, a hard labor, sweat is a part of the curse. But work is not a part of the curse, and God wanted his people to work. Now, we get the idea that, well, what's heaven going to be like for us as believers? What do we do in heaven? Do we have nothing to do? You know, people have that idea. Well, in heaven, there's, there's no work. What do you do in heaven? You just you sit on a cloud, and, and God gives you a halo, and he gives you a harp, and you just, you're playing your harp for ever. You know, after a while, let's face it, after a while, I mean, probably be good on the harp, uh, but you would think there's got to be something more. No, God's going to have work for us to do. And so the Lord wants his people to work diligence, diligently. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But now second reason for the Sabbath rest. God wanted his people not only to work diligently, but to rest completely. See, man is a house of three rooms. 1 Thessalonians 5.23, I pray that your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete, blameless in the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Your you're made spirit, that's how we know God in our spirit, soul, that's our mind, will, and emotions, and body, that's the physical part of life. And the Sabbath was given one day in seven, see the word Sabbath, Shabbat, means rest, and it's to cease from labor, it was given to, for us to rest, and to take a blow, so to speak, to uh, to, to put aside all the working things and to just rest our spirit, our soul, and our body. Some people don't ever rest. I like this quote I ran across. It says, the devil wants us to work when we rest, and God wants us to rest even when we work to enjoy his peace and his rest all the time. But the devil will, even in your quote-unquote off days, you're still working because you're, you can't ever shut it off and you, you have trouble. Uh, you wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning and uh, you have to use the restroom and then you're thinking, you're thinking about work, you're thinking about business, you're thinking about decisions, and you can't go to sleep because you can't shut it off. You're constantly working. The devil wants to keep you fried like that. It is vain for you to stay up late, to, to, uh, to rise up early, to stay up late, to eat the bread of painful labors, Psalm 127. It says, for he gives to his beloved even in his sleep. So God wanted his people a good thing. Hey, one in seven is a day to rest, to refuel, to recharge completely, spiritually, mentally, physically, emotionally. In all ways, your spirit, your soul, your body. There's a Greek proverb that says this, you will break the bow if you keep it always bent. If you're always go, 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 seven days a week, and there is no end of that, it's just keep you pedal to the metal, God didn't create you for that. He doesn't want you to do that. He wants you to take one day, you set it aside, and you rest. Hey, a lumberjack is not wasting his time when he stops chopping to sharpen his axe. And that's what the rest does for us. For us. It sharpens us spiritually, emotionally, mentally, and physically. So God wanted his people to work diligently. Six days you shall labor. God wanted his people to rest completely. And the most important, God wanted his people to worship regularly and worship sincerely, to worship him from the heart. One day in seven, set apart for God. And you say, well, we only worship God one day in the week, one day in seven. No, you worship God every day. But there's one day that's a special day. You set that aside. You don't do any work. You set it aside as holy, as sacred, and you give yourself to the Lord in a special day of undivided attention and undivided worship. And that is 
critical. It is critical in the Lord's uh, commandments that you do that, that you remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Somebody as well said, you know, we worship our work, we work at our play, and we play at our worship. God doesn't want us to work at our, our worship, our, whatever I just said. He doesn't want us to worship our work. A lot of people do that. Don't do that. You shall have no other gods before me. Don't worship your work. Don't work at your play. Everything is a stress and a strain. You know, have you ever gone on vacation and then you come back from vacation needing a vacation? Because you're, you went to Disney and you just, what did you do? You spent a boatload of money and you went in the summer because that's when everything, you know. Is, uh, I love what Jim Gaffigan says about going to Disney World in the summer. He said, what's that like? He said, think about standing in line at the DMV on the surface of the sun. <laughs> That's what it's like going to Disney. Uh, you just stand in line for a long period of time. You're sweating, and you're paying a ton of money to do it. But sometimes we go on vacation, and we come home, and we need a vacation because we're exhausted. We have been working at our play. But the worst of all is when you play at your worship. And you're not giving God your full attention. You're not giving him your whole heart. Hey, one day in seven is really set apart for the Lord. Now, here's the picture, just so we get it. The tithe is the Lord's. The Bible teaches us that. When it comes to our treasure, hey, a tenth belongs to God. As we learn in Genesis 28, way before the law ever came into existence, Genesis 28 with Jacob, when he had an experience with the Lord at a place called Luz, which he changed the name to, uh, Luz means separation, he changed the name to Bethel, the house of God. God was in this place and I did not know it. This is an awesome place. I'm going to name it Bethel, the house of God. And he said, all that you had given me, Lord, I give back a tenth to you. And a tenth just says that, God, you own it all. Everything I have is a gift from you, but I'm going to bring the tithe, the tithe that belongs to you, just as a representation that it all belongs to you. And that's your treasure. The tithe is the treasure. But now the Sabbath day deals with time. And one in seven belongs to God, your time. Now it all belongs to God. Because everything is a gift from God. Our time is a gift from God. Breath in your lungs is a gift from God. But one in seven is a representation that, God, I recognize that it all belongs to you. And I'm setting aside this day that you have told me to set aside because I'm going to keep it holy and sacred. This is your day, and I'm going to worship you, not only only, not only rightly, not only reverently, but regularly. And this is a great blessing from the Lord. You know, that's why it is such a crime when church becomes a place that's boring. How many people have ever been to boring church? Can I see your hand? Okay. Not today, right? Not today. But you've been to boring. I, I mean, I grew up in boring church. So you go to boring church and newsflash, nobody likes boring church. But we say this. We say, well, you, you know, this is... We grow up, this is God's house. Church is God's house. Church is God's thing. Uh, Jesus said, uh, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates will not prevail against it. Gates of hell will not prevail against it. And so God must like this. God must like boring church. God does not like boring church. Hey, the Bible is the most exciting book in the world. And we come together as children of God, as those who have been bought with a price in the Lord Jesus, and we come to celebrate the King of kings and Lord of lords. God forbid that we have preachers and people that lead the music and they're bored with the King of kings and Lord of lords. We come and we should be excited to worship him, the God of the universe. So if this is a great blessing to gather one day a week, and to worship God. So remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Remember why it was established. It, it, it's connected to creation, commemorate creation. It's connected to their deliverance from Israel. It's a sign between God and the sons of Israel. Remember why it's so important. It's work, then it's rest, 
and it's resting in the Lord and worshiping Him. And then thirdly, remember what the Sabbath means to us today. See, because that's the rub for Christians, okay? I, I understand what it meant for them if I was a Christian living in Old Testament times, what it would mean for me, but I, I'm not a Christian living in, I'm not an Old Testament saint. I'm not living in Old Testament times. I'm living in New Testament times. So what does the fourth commandment, what am I supposed to glean for that? It's Sunday, and we're here worshiping, gathered to worship, although we're down a little bit uh, because the people that really need this sermon aren't here. Uh, let's just face it. Uh, just saying. I mean, it's hard not to say that, but uh, they need to know this. But it's Sunday. It's not Saturday. So the Jews, would all Old Testament Jews, they gather on Saturday. During the time of Jesus in the Gospels, what would he do? They would gather on Saturday, the Sabbath day, Shabbat Shalom. You hear that in, in Israel today, uh, Sabbath peace. And uh, they would come together to, at the synagogue on Saturday. Well, we don't do that. We come on Sunday. So what does it mean to us today? Well, it's important to remember the distinction between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. So they had the Sabbath day. We have in the New Testament something greater, which is called the Lord's Day. The Lord's Day. Now, was the Sabbath day important? Yes. And is the principle of one in seven important? Yes. Do we say the fourth commandment commands us to meet on Saturday, as some do? Seventh-day Adventists, they meet on Saturday. Seventh-day Baptists, they meet on Saturday. They take the fourth commandment and they, they take it legalistically and say, that's when you're supposed to meet because that's what it says. Well, the Sabbath day is Old Testament. In the New Testament, we have the Lord's day. And why is that so important? Because the first day of the week, that's when Jesus rose from the grave. There's no getting around that. He rose on Sunday on the first day of the week. Mark tells us that, Luke tells us that, and John tells us that. On Sunday, that's when the Holy Spirit was given. On the first day of the week, that's when God sent His Holy Spirit. At the Feast of Weeks, the Feast of Ingathering, and the church was born on that day, and 3,000 came to Christ and were baptized on that day. The Holy Spirit was given on the first day, on Sunday. Uh, Jesus appeared to his, his disciples, the resurrected Christ, on Sunday. John, in Revelation chapter 1, said, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. That's the first day of the week, the Lord's day. And God gave him, the Lord Jesus appeared to him and gave him the book of the Revelation. And when did that occur? On Sunday, on the first day of the week, on the Lord's day. Everything changed on the Lord's day for the Christian. And because Jesus Christ came up out of that tomb, we worship, and the early church always worshiped on Sunday. I love this story that I read about J. Vernon McGee. He said he was talking to a man, and they were arguing about the Sabbath. And the man said to J. Vernon McGee, I'll give you $100 if you would show me where the Sabbath day has changed. McGee answered, I don't think it has been changed. Saturday is Saturday. It's the seventh day of the week, and it is the Sabbath day. I realize our calendar has been adjusted and can be off a few days, but we won't even consider that point. The seventh day is still Saturday, and it's still the Sabbath day. But then he got a gleam in his eye and said, the man said to him, then why don't you keep the Sabbath day if it hasn't been changed? And J. Vernon McGee answered and said this, the day hasn't changed, but I have been changed. I've been, giving a new, been given a new nature. I am joined to Christ. I am part of the new creation. We celebrate the first day because that is the day he rose from the grave. And that, it, that is what it means that the ordinances, Colossians 2, have been nailed to the cross. Hey, we worship on Sunday. That's the Lord's day. They had the Sabbath day, the seventh day. We have the first day, the Lord's day in which we worship. The principle of commandment number four hasn't changed. 
honor the Sabbath day, as some people say, the Christian Sabbath, which is the Lord's day, and keep it holy. Secondly, they worked and worshiped, and we worship and work. Now, the Lord says six days you shall work, but the seventh is the Sabbath day. It's the day of rest. In it you shall do no work. So they would work six days from Sunday to Friday and rest on Saturday. In Christ, we reverse that. What do we do the first day of the week? We worship. We worship and rest in the Lord on the first day of the week. And we worship and then we work. They would work and then they worship. They're under the old covenant. We're under the new covenant. And what do we do? We start out every week and we say, God, we give you this week and we're going to take the very first day to worship you, Lord Jesus, who rose again on Sunday morning, the first day, the Lord's day. It's a picture of salvation because we worship and we rest in the finished work of Jesus, and then we go out from here, and we work, and we spread the gospel. We come in here to be refreshed and renewed and reminded of the truth, and we all have a tendency. What is church? It's to return us to true north as we hear from the Word of God, preach the Word. Paul told Timothy, reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. So we come to church to hear the Word of God, because here is true north, and we we all have a tendency to drift from true north, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. We come together and boom, we're put back onto true north. And ch coming to church and hearing sermons, it's not so much you're hearing things you've never heard before. You may hear truth that you've never heard presented like that before, but the truth doesn't change. If it's new, it's not true. But we come to be encouraged in the truth, and we come to worship Him to prepare us to work. Matthew 6, what did Jesus say? But seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. And that's what we do at the first of the week, this side of Calvary. And then number three, they were before Christ, and we are after Christ. See, the Old Testament says someone is coming, and the New Testament says that someone is here, and his name is Jesus, and he changes everything. We're a new creation in Christ. It's far better to live this side of the cross than to live on the Old Testament side of the cross. Now, you're still saved the same way. You're saved by trusting in God's provision for your sin. No one was ever saved by keeping the Ten Commandments because nobody could keep the Ten Commandments. As it says in Galatians chapter 3, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ. The law shows you that you're a sinner. The law is like a mirror. It shows you that you're filthy. Now, everybody looked in the mirror this morning, hopefully, before you came to church. You looked in the mirror. Oh, I, my face is dirty. Or, oh, I missed a spot shaving. Well, you didn't try and clean your face with the mirror. That would be stupid. That's not the purpose of the mirror. The purpose of the mirror is to show you how dirty you are, to show you how out of whack things are. The law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ. They were before Christ, and they worshiped on the seventh day. We are after Christ, and we worship on resurrection day. This is what Paul says in Colossians 2. Therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day, things which are a mere shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. So, the Ten Commandments, God's moral law. Hey, he hasn't rescinded murder. He hasn't rescinded adultery. He hasn't rescinded stealing or lying or coveting or he is the only God, or this is how you worship, but don't take his name in vain. You can't say, well, we're New Testament times. We can do all that stuff. No, you can't. Now, when it comes to the fourth commandment, we honor and remember and observe the Sabbath. We just know for the Christian, the Sabbath has become the Lord's day, and we gather on the Lord's day to worship him. And listen, this is convicting because think about how 
we have let Sunday in our own lives, not just as a country, but in our own lives, we've let that slip so far because it's not that big a deal. Ah, oh, she's missing church, no big deal. I'll watch it online. I'll watch it later online. And lots of people, they work on Sundays. And I'm not knocking them for working on Sundays. That, I mean, that has, is a situation that maybe they, they can't get out of. But, but we, we don't have the same reverence for the day. You remember when the movie came out, Chariots of Fire, the, the movie about the, the Olympic runner Eric Lytle. Well, his, his race, 1924 Olympics, and he was a dynamic, godly guy. He became a missionary, Scottish guy. He was a missionary after the Olympics and uh, died on the mission field. But his, his qualifying heat on his race was on Sunday. He said, I can't do it. I'm not going to race on Sunday. Why? You got to do it. And no, I'm not going to do it. Why? Because Sunday is the Lord's day, and I'm not going to race on the Lord's day. He had that conviction in his heart that he was not to do that. He was to honor God. And I love it. And the movie brings this out. It's a true part of the movie. When he gets ready to run the race, the 400 meter, which wasn't his race, he had to say, well, I can't run the hundreds. That's my race. I'll run the 400. Well, that's not your race, Eric. Yeah, but I'm going to do it. And right before the race, somebody handed him a piece of paper. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 30. The one who honors me, him will I honor. And he honored God, and God honored him. And Eric Lytle won that race and set a world record in an event that wasn't even his event. Hey, we've gotten so far away from that. And this is a time to search your heart and say, hey, am, am I just blowing off the fourth commandment like it doesn't matter? Am I just doing my own thing on Sunday? Is it just another day? Adrian Rogers told about a, a very uh, wonderful man who came to a beggar once on the street and he had a string of seven coins and he handed that man six coins, silver coins, and said, I want to give you this. And he kept one for himself and kept it in his pocket. But that beggar was also a thief. And as the man turned to go, he reached his hand in his pocket, and he stole the seventh one. Isn't that what many of us are doing? God has given us six days to labor and do our work, and we steal the seventh too. And we say, I'm going to spend that on my pleasure. I'm going to do what I want to do. Hey, the seventh day is for the Lord. And it was Saturday for the Jews. It is the Lord's Day, Sunday, the first day of the week for the Christian. And we are to honor God with all that we have and gather to worship Him and put Him first and say no to our pleasures and yes to His service. My friend, we're all guilty of breaking the Ten Commandments. We are sinners before God. That's why Jesus came. He came to pay the price for our sin. He came to be our Savior. He died on the cross and rose again from the dead. And if you'll put your faith and trust in Him, He will save you now and forever. So pray with me. Lord Jesus, I need you. I know that I'm a sinner and I'm lost and I can't save myself. But Jesus, I believe that you're God in the flesh. I believe you died on the cross for my sins and rose again from the dead. And right now, Jesus, I surrender my life, my heart, my all to you. Forgive me, cleanse me, save me, come to live inside me, change my life. And I promise to follow you all the days that you give me. In Jesus' name. My friend, if you'll pray that kind of prayer and mean it, the Lord will come in and your life will never be the same. If you just prayed that prayer with me, please let us know. The contact information is there. We want to pray with you and help you any way we can. Listen, you're important to God, and you're important to us, and we're here for you.